Hi guys, this is the VCAR 2014 Specialist Maths Exam 2 Multiple Choice Questions Part 2 video and these are my unofficial solutions of the VCAR exam. This is VCAR copyright material and these are just my unofficial solutions. So starting at question 9, having already covered questions 1 to 8 in part 1 of this series of 3 videos, we find that the distance of z from the point 3 plus 2i is equal to 2 units, that is a circle by the way guys, with centre at 3 and 2 and with radius 2, that is intersected exactly twice by the line given by da 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 da. Alright, well, unfortunately there's no quick way of doing this, uh, you've just got to slug away at it bit by bit and just eliminate the ones which are obviously wrong and then just hone in on the one which is the one you want. So let's draw a diagram. There's our circle. It's got a center of 3 and 2 as I said there and it's got a radius of 2. So you can help to draw these um, extremities in just to sort of get a feel for what we're doing here. I think we'll start at E which seems to me to be obviously wrong. That is the that is saying to us that x equals 5. Well that that only intersects once, so that's out of contention. Let's go for D, which looks also wrong. That is saying that the Y value equals zero, so that's wrong as well. Let's go for another one now. Oh, A today. Well, that is saying that the distance of Z from the point I, which I've shown you here, there, is equal to the distance of Z from the point negative one which is this little beastie over here, okay? So that gets you a line, which is obviously y equals minus x, and that's not going anywhere near the circle, so that one's out of contention as well. All right, <clears throat> very exciting. We're down to B and C now. Um, B is looking a little bit interesting. C is looking, hmm, this bit here's a bit of a worry. So I think we'll go for B first, shall we? So, ooh, look at that. There's B. I think we've got a winner, don't you? Now, what B is saying is the distance of Z from the centre of the circle is the same as the distance of Z from the point 5 plus naught I, or just 5, here. Now, if you work that out, guys, as the perpendicular bisector of the line joining these two points, you'll get this line. You'll get this line. And you'll work out that it basically goes through there, it goes through there, and we have a winner. Now, just as a PS... If we went for C, that's saying that the distance of Z from the centre of the circle is the same as the distance of Z is from the point naught and 10, right up here somewhere. And if you actually work that out, it's so far away from the circle that it's not funny. So it's not going to get the Guernsey, guys. So the answer is B. All right, question 10, ladies and gentlemen. This is a differential equations kind of question, stirred tank. They always put the stirred tanks in because students find them the hardest, but they're not hard at all. They're actually, they're absolutely easy. So um, when you get to know how to do them, that is. So we've got a large tank, which initially holds 1500 litres of water, in which 100 kilograms of salt is dissolved, and a solution containing two kilograms of salt per litre, which I'm wondering how on earth you would ever get two kilograms of salt in any litre of water, I uh, would imagine it would be fairly difficult, flows into the tank at the rate of eight litres per minute, and the mixture is stirred continuously, yes, yes, we know that, and it flows out of the tank faster at a rate of 10 litres per minute. So the volume of this tank is going down at the rate of two litres every minute, ladies and gentlemen. Differential equation for Q, the number of kilograms of salt, in the tank after t minutes is given by. Well, actually, this is really easy. We just do a mass balance on the, the tank system, and we don't need to know how much salt was initially in the tank at all. That's just a red herring, actually. So here's our tank. Always draw a picture. Please always draw a picture. And put in the following. This is the volumetric flow rate in, I subscript for in. That's 8 litres per minute. The concentration in is this one here, 2 kilograms per litre. So the mass rate in, the mass rate in, ladies and gentlemen, is this times this, and that's what you need. That's what you need. Now, the volumetric uh, rate out is 10 litres per minute, and the concentration going out is whatever the concentration of this tank is in here, because it's 
uh, it's mixed, it's stirred, so it's got a uniform concentration. That's why they tell you that it's continuously stirred. All right, now all we need to do, guys, all we need to do is to say that the rate of accumulation is equal to the continuous rate in minus the continuous rate out. That's what it is, and it's that simple. That's what you call a mass balance. The rate of accumulation equals the rate going in minus the rate going out. And we know that the rate going in is this one, uh, 8 times 2, VI times CI, and the rate going out is this one here, VO times CO, which is 10 times this beastie over here. Now, what's this, what's this Mr. Wolfman? This is just the amount of salt in the tank Concentration is the amount over the volume, which is the amount at any one time T divided by the volume in the tank, which, as we've already explored, is 1,500 litres minus 2 litres for every minute that you've been operating since time equals zero. Okay, okay, because it's going in at the rate of 8, going out at the rate of 10, so it's losing 2 litres every minute. So that's it, guys. Now, if we can just simplify that and find that in our solutions, we'll be very, very happy. It's 16 minus, now, I think I've just cancelled by a factor of 2 here. Yeah, 5Q over 750 minus T, and is that somewhere? Oh, yes. So the answer is A, which uh, we're very happy about. All right, so that's that one done. Question 11. This is an Euler's method one, which are always very, very simple if you know what to do. We've got dy dx equals x cubed minus xy, and y equals 2 when x equals 1, all right? Using Euler's method with a step size of 0 0.1, the approximation to y when x is 1.1 is. Okay, piece of cake, guys. Uh, here's the CASI way on the TI CAS handheld device. Very easy. You've just got to know what the sequence of the entries here are. So here's your dy dx here, x cubed minus x times y, comma. Then you put the independent variable which is x, comma, then the dependent variable, which is y, comma. Then in curly brackets, you put where x starts and stops, uh, and then a comma. Then you put the starting value of y and the step size and hit enter, and it is all laid out before you in wonderful, wonderful technological glory. So you get this um, at 1, when x was 1, y was 2, when x was 1.1, y was 1.9 which is over there which is mighty fine that's d okay now here's the manual way in case you didn't like that or you forgot how to do it on the cas but please don't forget just have it at your fingertips uh, so we've got dy dx equals x cubed minus xy yes and when x is 1 that comes to that which would be that minus 1 now we're looking for delta y now Delta y would be the step size times the gradient when x was at its starting point, which was when x was 1. So that would be 0 0.1 times negative 1, right? The negative 1's coming up from here. So now we've got our delta y, so therefore we're only doing one step uh, in this process. So therefore the new value of y, approximate new value of y, would be um, the old value of y plus this delta y thingy here, which is minus 0.1, as you've just seen. So therefore, y, when x is 1.1, would be its original value 2, minus this, which is 0.1, which gets us to 1.9, which again is mighty fine. Okay, that's that question done, which gets us to d. All right, uh, question 12. We have here that dy dx equals the square root of 2x to the 6 plus 1, and we know that y is 5 when x is 1. Find the value of y when x is 4. This is given by. Now, just check it out. Have a look at the options. We don't have to actually work anything out. We just have to state how you would get it. Okay? Now, this kind of question often confounds a lot of students, and it's absolutely as simple as. So just have a look at this, guys. When you see this kind of question, this is the way you do it, or I'd suggest that this is the way you would do it. You know that a definite integral works like this. Y when x is 4 minus y when x is 1 is just this, isn't it? Because the antiderivative of dy dx is just y, okay? You see that? It, it's an absolute no-brainer when you look at it and think about it, right? So therefore, we can then say, therefore y when x is 4 will be y when x is 1 plus this thingy, okay? Just using the dy dx from above, right? Okay, and they've already told us what, uh, what y is when x equals 1, y is 5. So that's really the question. 
It's really, really simple. Okay, so don't be confused by that. The answer is C. Okay, question 13. Using the substitution that u equals the square root of x plus 1, then this thingy here can be expressed as... Well, guys, these are really easy marks if you know what to do. So please have a look at this and see if it helps you. All right, now, we're told that u is going to be x plus 1 all to the half, or, or the square root of x plus 1. Now, let's work out du dx and therefore du. du dx, just using normal rules of differentiation, gets you that. Therefore, du is equal to dx over 2 times x plus 1 to the half. Okay, so I've got to get a du there, so I've got to manufacture a dx somehow over 2 times x plus 1 to the half in this integral to make it into a du. Now, what am I doing here? Well, you see, I've got this little bit of a complication here, guys. I've got to get this in terms of u as well. So I've got to get x plus 2 in terms of u. So very simply, if you start from here again and square both sides, you'll get u squared is x plus 1, therefore doing a little bit of um, fancy footwork algebraically, you'll get x plus 2 equals u squared plus 1. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is change the terminals around from x values to u values. That's very important to do that. You can never mix those up, otherwise you come a big, big cropper. So when x is naught, uh, you can quite easily see that u is going to be 1, okay? The square root of 1, which is 1. And also when x is 2, let's work that out, 2 plus 1 to the half would be root 3. All right, I think we're ready to go now, guys. Roll the drums and get excited. Hence we have, now, all right, so what have I done there? I've got du, which was this thingy here. And what I've done to get that 2 down there, because there wasn't a 2 sitting in this thing, I've multiplied by 2 outside to compensate and put a 2 in here on the denominator. That's what I've done. Okay. So the du is this beastie here, and the u squared plus 1 is the x plus 2 term on the denominator of the original integrand up here. And I've got everything, all my ducks in a row, and now I'm going to hold my breath and look over here and see if the thing is there. Oh, marvellous, it's option E. Now, doesn't that make you feel good? See how easy it is? Just keep your cool, be systematic, and don't go too fast, and you'll be right. Question 14. This is a slope field question, guys. They're always a bit exciting, aren't they? Now, when I first saw this question, I thought, oh, heavens, this is really quite confusing. Because what I normally do is I just cast my eyeballs up the y-axis... Uh, that is when x is naught, and then along the x-axis, that is when y is naught, and I can usually see something which helps me a lot to get which option is the correct one. Setting one variable to naught and then looking at what's happening with the other one can be a great help, but in this case, it wasn't much of a help because when x was naught, looks like y started off at the origin as being undefined and then sort of bent over and became more negative e.g. less positive as you went up the y-axis and so I thought oh, something else is going on here I've got to come up with some other way of pulling a rabbit out of a hat and working out what's going on and that was to look at the various options a, b, c, d, e what am I really looking for here so I think I'll just um, hone in on what I'm supposed to be doing here uh, to work towards one of those solutions and Basically what I did was this. Eventually I came up with this idea. At the origin, dy dx is undefined, which indicates zero on the denominator, okay? The denominator is going to be zero. This would suggest option A, C or E. So B and D are out the window, okay? So we've cut it down to 60% of the possibilities already. Now if we look in quadrant one, this is very interesting. If we look along the line y equals x, you'll notice that dy dx is also undefined, okay? And by the way, this also applies to quadrant 3, but I'm just looking in quadrant 1 so I don't get myself too confused. And the plot thickens even more. So this particular bit of information suggests that either y minus x or x minus y 
would be on the denominator, okay? Now, furthermore, in quadrant 1, you'll notice, if you have a look at it, that when y is greater than x, e.g. up here, then dy dx is positive. And you'll also notice that when y is less than x down here, that dy dx is negative, all right? So what does that tell us, guys? That tells us that y minus x is on the denominator, and this, this trend is confirmed, or this fact is also confirmed in the other quadrants, if you have a look at them, in quadrant 2, 3, and 4. That is, when y is greater than x, you'll get the derivative is positive, and when y is less than x, you'll get dy dx is negative. And you can work that out by just extending in your mind this line here. Anywhere under the line, below the line, is where y is less than x. Anywhere above the line is where y is greater than x. So I think we've nailed it, guys. We've nailed it down to option C. Okay? Marvellous, isn't it? Question 15. I'd just like to sneak this one in because then I can cover the last seven questions up to it, including question 22 in the third and final video of these multiple choice questions. This one's quite simple, actually. You've just got to know your double angle formula to be able to do it. So, um, we're saying here, if theta is the angle between this vector and this vector, then cos of 2 theta, okay? So that's just a little bit spiced up there with that cos of 2 theta, but no problem for us, guys. Cos of 2 theta is 2 cos squared theta minus 1. So if we can work out cos theta, which is very simple to do, we can just apply it in this formula and work out what cos 2 theta is and come up with the answer. We know that by the definition of the vector dot product, cos theta equals a dotted with b over the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b. So let's just work through with that. a dotted with b, you know how to work that out, don't you? Of course you do. It's this number here times this number, this coefficient here, which is a 1, plus this coefficient times this coefficient plus this coefficient times this coefficient, which of course is this, over the magnitude of a, which if you work it out by Pythagoras's rule in three dimensions, it's going to be root 20. Same thing for b. So let's see what that gets us. Yes, cancellation throughout the nation. Then we get minus 16 over 20, which is minus 4 over 5. No problem. That's cos theta. Therefore, cos 2 theta will be 2 times that cos theta, which is minus 4 over 5, all squared minus 1. And we are very, very close to the answer, which is going to get us that. Just be careful with your multiplication. And you're going to get 7 over 25, which is B. Beautiful. All right, I hope you got something out of that. And we'll see you all soon for the exciting last instalment of uh, these multiple choice questions.